This video is only possible thanks to viewers like you. To support the channel and get more, go to patreon.com slash optimistic duelist and subscribe. Link in the description. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Optimistic Duelist, and welcome to another episode of Homestuck Explained. This time we're revisiting the Exiles, so we can cover two points I ended up glossing over last time before we officially move on to the Beta Kids. So let's dive right in. Now, I breezed over this in our last video, but it's really worth exploring the relationship between the Exiles and democracy in Homestuck. By its nature, Spurb is a kind of test, not just of the kids playing the game, but also of the society that created and nurtured them. And in that respect, the Carapaceans serve a pretty interesting purpose, because by their nature, Carapaceans are highly flexible and reactive entities. When the kids enter their game, they bring cultural detritus, not only in the form of physical objects, but also in the form of ideas. Ideas that they largely got from their societies. And I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that the role of Carapaceans, and especially exiles, is to become inheritors of that society's ideals and values. That basically comes to pass with the Troll Session, the society that spades Slick and his entourage set up seems to be a fascist, might-makes-right sort of society devoted to profiteering and money-making. Not much different from Alternia. And also like Alternia, it's an ultimately futile attempt at society, usurped and commandeered for the purposes of Doc Scratch. The Beta Kids session, though, presents us with something fairly special, and that's the idea of democracy, as all of the Beta Kids, with the arguable exception of Jade, are Americans, and the exiles that aid them seem to absorb some of the best of America's ideals. Ideas like liberty, reason, civility, and equality. Such as, for example, the idea that a peasant could rise to become a mayor, and play a prominent role in politics for the good of the people. We can and have spent lifetimes arguing about whether or not America in real life lives up to these ideals, but the ideals themselves are genuinely noble and even inspiring. And that is what the Exiles seem to absorb, the optimistic, hopeful promise of the American dream. It would be a tall ask to require a bunch of teenagers to not only survive their game and reach godhood, but also do the hard work of growing up while accurately remembering all of the best foundational principles that made their civilization possible. So, it does make a lot of sense to have an existentially default race of people who can flexibly internalize and build upon those principles, especially if that same group of people can later be guided and directed by the fledgling gods. What's more, Homestuck deliberately singles out these virtues of American society as wise, important, and valuable, by repeatedly associating them with the symbol of light. These ideals are, of course, best embodied by the symbol of Cantown, an imaginary society standing in for the promise of the eventual real thing. The cans that make it up representing more than just the physical space the town would occupy, but also the can-do, go-getting American spirit, perhaps best captured by the mantra, Yes, we can. Rose says herself, The preservation of Cantown has tremendous symbolic importance. We are all that's left of our respective races, Kanaya. We are the light of civilization. It is our responsibility to carry the torch through the abyss whilst keeping it lit and set it upon the hearth of the new world. Its light, our light, will spread throughout our creation, but only, Kanaya, only if we respect the light of civilization itself, if we respect the light of democracy. The second thing I wanted to mention doesn't have so much to do with exiles themselves, but the command stations they use to interact with the players. I've come to feel that Spurb has various mechanics whose design evokes the various key verbs of the classes. For example, Spurb's various enemies echo Prince and Bard's destroy verb, since they both threaten the heroes with destruction and invite the heroes to destroy them in turn for their rewards. The alchemy system evokes Maiden Sylph's make or create verb, since, you know, it creates stuff. 
Incidentally, I think it's interesting that we never really see Princess and Barge alchemizing anything. The closest we get is seeing that Dirk created whatever this abomination of an outfit is, and the tricksters trying to alchemize a sword for him and just ending up with his regular katana again. Gamzee never seems to alchemize anything whatsoever, and Aridan played through his entire game with a gun he found on Alternia. Even when he upgraded to his magic, I mean, science wand, he had Kanaya, a sylph, make it for him. The server player mechanic has server players act in a role of service for the benefit of their client, and client players in the role of receiving service for their own benefit, echoing the knight and the page respectively. And the Grist Torin application lets players steal Grist from each other, echoing the thief and the rogue. Here it's worth mentioning that Dave is particularly effective at being a server player, to the point that he ends up assisting both Jade and Rose. While Vriska, a thief inclined to steal for her own benefit, and so as existentially at odds with the role of a server player as possible, is particularly terrible to her server player. It's also worth mentioning Dirk, who's deeply invested in acting like a knight just like Dave, and attempts to act out this desire by trying to coordinate and manage his friend's entries into his session. Without Dave's time abilities, however, he's quickly overwhelmed by the challenge of keeping track of so many situations at once. But the 13-year-old version of himself that he programs as an artificial intelligence autoresponder for his chat program succeeds at this thanks to being a supercomputer with cyber omniscience, even taking on Dave's red text color in the process. AR actually outstrips Dave's achievement in this regard, eventually managing every single Alpha Kid's entry simultaneously. But his intrinsic nature as a Prince of Heart shines through, and he ends up partly using the process to orchestrate Alpha Dirk's suicide. In other words, destroying an iteration of his own self, or heart. The Oracle Clouds on Skya let heroes who can peer into its skies glimpse the things that it sees and knows, putting them in the role of seers or mages. And the horror terrors in the furthest ring sometimes select players for relationships of mutual service, which when heavily indulged can evoke the dynamic between the magician classes, particularly the witch, and their familiars. All of which finally brings us to the command terminals. I believe using these machines to issue commands puts an individual in the position of a lord or muse character, by definition. The main role of a lord or a muse is to command reality or other people to carry out their will, either through direct orders or inspiration. Which class specifically is invoked probably just comes down to how the individual interacts with the command terminal and the power it gives them over the person they're viewing. Let's put this into a bit of context. Commands are the actual name of the little arrows that title every single page of the comic. Every time you click on a link to the next page of the story, you're inserting a command into the story's plot and the characters' heads. The Exiles submit some of these commands through their terminals, but Caliborn? Caliborn's even more direct. A good chunk of his story is literally spent inside a command station of his own, where he has his own command terminal, just like the Exiles, except his doesn't just let him view a single Spurb session, but the entire story of Homestuck. Through his, Caliborn slowly but surely submitted and made his way through every single one. Every command in the story was once upon a time inserted by him and all Calliope spends most of the narrative playing along, until eventually his time to play his game runs out, and she's able to dominate over the narrative, defeating Lord English and ending his reign of terror once and for all. Caliborn commands the story for his own benefit, and Alt Calliope invites his command over it like a predictable pawn for the eventual benefit of everyone who will ever live since without Caliborn, none of the cast would have ever existed in the first place. In Homestuck, the experience of viewing, understanding, and then orchestrating Homestuck according to your will is the ultimate manifestation of power, as shown to us by its most impactful characters. And the command terminal, from the very beginning, represents a microcosm of that experience. I just think that's really neat. Huge thanks go out to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to help support the channel and come join us at our awesome and growing Discord community, feel free to join us for as little as a dollar a month.
You can also find me on the r Swap Reddit and Discord. That's all for now, so thank you again, and as always, keep rising.